and it's uh, Peter here from AJS and it's my delight to uh, introduce another live online demonstration from a jeweler's workshop somewhere around Australia and this week we're in sunny Adelaide and it's my delight to introduce Catherine Grocock. Welcome Catherine. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's uh, great to have you here and uh, you just wanted to do a little um, welcome to country. Yeah, I'd like to acknowledge that I am living and working and creating on Ghana land. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging uh, and acknowledge the incredible work that they have done in looking after this beautiful and sacred country down here that I have the incredible privilege of uh, yeah, living on. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Now today's um, workshop is entitled Riveting Rivets. So we're making cold connections. Could you just tell us all what that's about? Um, basically, a rivet is a, uh, a way of joining material uh, and one of the best uh, ways of joining material that doesn't have to be soldered. So it's great for being able to join materials uh, like acrylics, plastic, laminates, um, metals that can't be soldered like uh, aluminium or titanium. Uh, so it's a very handy technique to know because uh, it means that you can join all sorts of materials in your jewellery uh, that otherwise you wouldn't be able to uh, if you had to be able to solder them. So cold connections make a wonderful addition to your uh, techniques uh, so that you can um, yeah, use a, a variety of different materials. Indeed. And there's no flames involved. So that's sort of nice too. <laughs> That's all right. No flame. No flame. <laughs> Just accurate hammering. <laughs> okay. So there's various sorts of rivets, I understand. So mm -hmm. you just explain that yeah. one. So basically, there are a number of different rivets. What we're going to be um, focusing on today is the uh, classic or kind of standard rivet. Uh, so I'm going to draw some up for you so that you can see. And what these are, these are like cut in half images. So if you imagine that you've got your two pieces of material, you've got a piece of material here and a piece of material here. So basically what I've drawn is your two pieces of material, top and bottom, and I've drilled a hole down the middle. Uh, then what I'm doing is I'm inserting a piece of wire into this gap. And it should be uh, a nice tight fit. Now, as I said, there, there's, kind of, there's two types of standard rivet. Uh, the one that I like the most and that I use the most is called the classic mushroom rivet. And so basically when you hammer, you're gonna end up with this nice, kind of mushroom shape where the edges of the metal of the wire are pushed over and they then enclose the pieces of material inside it. Um, the other type of standard rivet, move that over. Is where you do the same thing, but using a different faced hammer you end up with this shape. So it stands up a little bit more um, off the, the metal. Um, so it can have a much more, like it, it, it's got a different appearance. So depending on the aesthetic of your piece, uh, you might decide to choose either one of those. So they're the ones we're gonna focus on today. Um, however, Hopefully, there might be another demonstration uh, in the future where we'll focus on um, some of the other types of rivets. So I'll give you a quick look at those so that you know what they are, and then hopefully you'll join us for another, another video in the future. So uh, you have um, what's called flush or countersink, countersunk rivets. So a very similar idea to this, but you're trying to eliminate the, um, like the head on the top. So if I show you, um, 
like this is this is an example of quite a classic mushroom rivet. So you've got um, yeah, kind of this look up the top on there, and on the back you can't see anything. It's kind of um, it's disappeared into the metal. So what's happened there is you've got your piece of metal or the material that you're using. But instead of just drilling straight through, you've gotten something like a ball bird and you've taken away a little bit of the material from the top and the bottom so that when you hammer, the wire actually spreads into the gap and then you actually file it off flat so that you can't, yeah, you can't see it. Um, if it is the same material as what your, um, your base material is. So for example, um, on this piece, I've got a classic um, mushroom rivet down the bottom, but I've got two flush or countersunk rivets on either side here. Um, and while this material is aluminium, the rivets are sterling silver. So all you see is just the round um, dot because it's just ever so slightly a different color. Uh, but on the back of, um, or on the top of this one, there are kind of a couple of rivets um, on those and they are the same material, they're silver, you, can't, you cannot see them. They're completely invisible. Uh, but I don't know if you can pick up on the back there. There's a couple of little rivets just there. Yeah, um, we can see those, yeah. Yeah. So they are also flush rivets, but you might be able to tell that um, they haven't, the, uh, the metal hasn't quite filled all the holes. So you end up with a little shadow or an empty bit there. So you do have to be very um, diligent in hammering those ones. Okay, you also have uh, a tube rivet. Uh, so this is where you have that um, plain, yeah, you've got your, your couple of pieces of metal, you've, um, however, what you have got, is a tube inside. So you can actually see a hole. And so then you hammer it um, in, a, in a very similar way, but you'll end up with this happening. So from the side that, yeah, if you chopped in your, your piece in half, this is what you'd have. So you'd be able to actually see all the way through um, and your metal folds over. So that, you can see that happening here, uh, up the top. So this is a tube rivet up the top and it means that I can put a little jump ring um, yeah, through the entire piece. So yeah, the tube rivet just makes it, um, means that different things can go through the piece as well. Mm. And then finally, You've got a space rivet. So this is where you might, um, you have your pieces of material, but you need to keep them apart somehow. So what happens here is you'll actually put a tube that has an inside diameter that is the same as your drill hole. So that's your, your tube in the middle. And then you put your piece of wire through and you can finish that in any kind of way you want. So you could put a tube inside a tube, a piece of wire, finish it countersunk. Um, so yeah, you might be able to 
see on this one that I've got, um, yes, yeah, spaced, the tubing spaced in between. Um, and that just spreads the metal out and means you've got a bit of a, a visual, uh, you can look through the piece then um, as a way of seeing through it and spacing out the material that you're using. Um, so this is anodized aluminium. So again, you wouldn't be able to solder this in place, um, but it means you could have that lovely bright color of the aluminium and still have a functioning yeah, piece of jewelry. So they're the, uh, they're the rivets. That's the family of rivets. But uh, today we'll be focusing on these two up the top, the classic mushroom and square rivet. Well, I'll be interested to see how you get those shapes there. Uh, <laughs> it's all to do with that, anyway. <laughs> awesome. And we've got lots of uh, interested viewers as well. So um, please ask any questions along the way. That'd be great. Yeah. So welcome, everybody. <laughs> For those of you who've joined me, um, I'm Catherine Grocott. I am a studio tenant at the wonderful, amazing Jam Factory. Um, started making jewellery when I was seven years old with my mum. Uh, and, yeah, over the years have participated in classes. I've done, um, uh, yeah, master classes with different uh, jewellers over the years. Uh, and eventually led me to Jam Factory in Adelaide, so Australia's premier um, arts, craft and design centre, uh, where we have four departments. There's furniture, glass, ceramics and metal and jewellery. So I'm in the metal and jewellery department uh, and finishing off the associate program that they run here due to the problems with COVID last year. <laughs> so having a ball here. Um, and so, yeah, I have this amazing studio here and get to uh, create with the, the wonderful jewellery team headed up by Kath Inglis um, and Danny Barry. Yeah. So shall we get into uh, doing some uh, manufacturing, some actual making? So what are the some of the tools we're going to be using? Uh, yes. So you do need a variety of tools, but not a lot. Um, basically, you will need a something that you can drill with. So I'm using a, yeah, a little drill, drill block um, here. You'll need a drill bit. You will need um, something to measure. If you do not know the size of your wire um, or your drill bit, something that will be able to measure that. You need the wire and the material that you're going to work with. So I'm working with just some scrap aluminium for today and some copper. So hopefully you'll be able to quite clearly differentiate between um, the two and it's not hidden on camera. Uh, a pair of parallel pliers come in handy for when you're threading wire through. A centre punch is handy, again, for centering, like for marking out your holes when you're drilling. And you need some, you need a riveting hammer. So there's a couple of different types here. Um, and I'll kind of compare how they work when I when I'm demonstrating. Some tape uh, is very handy if you've got things like anodized aluminium that you don't want to mark. Um, and this protects your work from any hammer marks. A sanding stick um, or a file if you're going to be doing, um, especially if you're doing the flush rivets, very handy, uh, but also just for cleaning up work after you've drilled it. And then the secret weapon. <laughs> this is probably one of the best um, pieces of equipment that, yeah, you can have for riveting. Secret tool. Playing cards folded yeah. in half with some holes cut in them or punched in them. Uh, so I'll show you how those work. Um, now, I, have, I do have to acknowledge this is not my idea. Uh, this was taught to me by um, the lady who first introduced me to Cold Connections, and she learnt it from either Charles Luton Brain or Tim McCright. I can't remember because that was like uh, 15 years ago. But, um, yeah. 
really handy piece of kit. Playing card folded in half. <laughs> All right, shall we get started? Let's do it. Okay. Well, one of the first things um, you need to do for a rivet is to make sure that the um, drill bit that you're going to use to drill your hole is the same size as the wire you're going to use. You really do want a nice, tight, close fit for your wire um, to go through your material. If it's too loose, uh, when you start to hammer and bend the metal over, it won't have enough room and it, can, it has the potential to fall right through the hole if it's too big. Uh, so being able to make sure that your piece, um, your wire is nice and tight fitting is really important. So if you know, you know, you know what the size of your drill bit is um, and you know what size your wire is, great, go ahead. Um, but if you don't, one of the best ways to uh, check is, of course, to measure it. Um, so if you've got your calipers, uh, make sure on, zeroed, and take your measurement. So you're looking at, yeah, kind of a 1.2 mil um, piece of wire here. To measure your drill bit, um, I hope you can see this. You might draw this. Um, a drill bit. When you look at the drill bit, it goes kind of, there's your thread, but it has a very distinct peak. So from the top, you can kind of see this. Um, so what you want to do is measure it across this way. If you measure it from there to there, uh, unfortunately, you won't get a very accurate reading of your, your drill bit. So go across the peak um, to make sure you get an accurate measurement. So for this drill bit, I'm just going to have to take it up because I'm blind. There we go. See, I've got a 1.1. So I find that if I go down just a fraction less um, than my piece of wire, then that ensures I get that nice, clean, tight fit. So I pop my drill bit into my micromotor. If I am, if I do need to kind of very, very accurately um, drill my two piece, pieces together, I might sticky tape it together or possibly even glue it together with um, super glue drill the hole and then um, take it out. For the purposes of today, um, I'm just going to kind of do a, yeah, like a random hole just so that you can see. So I do get my little center punch, get my little hole, and I'm going to drill through one and then place it on top and drill through the other. If you've got um, you know, a little bit of lubricant for your drill bit, you can use that so that your drill is nice and smooth. Center. And hopefully you guys don't hear the grind of my motor. I've got one hole. We'll place it on top. Drill through. Get a little dent going. And drill my second hole. Catherine, just a question from Sam. Uh, what sort of drill lubricant do you use? Oh, this is just a, um, a standard drill bit. It's not a high, because I'm working with aluminium today, it's not a high speed steel or anything like that. Uh, so just one of the normal drill bits for a, um, 
interchangeable um, micromotor. Uh, AGS sell them. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, the lubricant. What's the lubricant? Oh, um, oh, I think it doesn't have a label on it anymore uh, because whatever the lubricant is took the glue off. I think from memory it was called Burr Life um, and it's just a little... Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a soft one. Uh, if you're up in Queensland, this will be liquid almost all year round instead of a soffit. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But, yeah, any kind of lubricant. I've also got um, – I've also used um, Peppy Lube. Um, I tend to use this one more for the backs of my saw blades um, because it's much more solid, uh, whereas I use this for my, my burrs, my dr drill bits, etc. Um, yeah. A oh, question from Silver. Can you use beeswax as a lubricant? Oh. Uh, I haven't used it myself for drill bits, but I do know people who use it for the backs of their saw blades. So I imagine you could um, give it a go and see what happens if it, if it, cuts through nice and easily and helps your drill bit, then yeah, that would be fine, I would imagine. Um, but I have never tried that myself. Um, yeah. No worries, thanks Catherine. That's all right. Okay, now we've got our two pieces. Because I'm wanting these to be nice and flush together, I'm gonna to give them a little bit of a clean up to get rid of the burr that's on the back. You know, every time you drill something, you'll have a tiny little Burr. So get rid of that. If you're doing something like, you know, using anodized aluminium or something, you might decide to, um, uh, you know, if you were getting them laser cut, get them very, very precisely cut before you anodize them so that you don't, um, yeah, kind of have to mark your work out or, you know, file it back because then you lose your color. So think, think through your design process as to um, when and how you're going to um, yeah, do your cleaning up. So I've got, my, um, I've got my two pieces there. Your next thing is to uh, clean up your ends of your wire. Um, so I... So I've got the end of my wire. Uh, now, can you guys see if I hold it there, is that going to... Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm basically just flattening, flattening the end of the wire so it's nice and clean, square, flush. Basically, a good rivet works a lot better if you can... Um, if you have a nice clean flat surface as soon as it's jagged or cut with pliers that leave that kind of point on it um, it's not as nice a rivet uh, you really do want to start with that nice kind of flat surface um, so quite often if I'm doing multiple you know rivets in one go I will actually do both ends and that means that I can do two rivets in one go kind of thing before I have to do this process again. So it's just a way of being kind of efficient. Um, now, one of your next things you can do if, this is more a case that if you've got super long pieces of wire, um, inserting them into a pair of parallel pliers is a wonderful way of giving you something to hold on to that's a bit easier to grip than a tiny piece of, you know, 1.2 mil wire. So I've got my first piece. I'm going to insert that. And it should be nice and firm and tight to get through. You don't want it to be um, easy to pop through. So I'm twisting. So I'm, I'm out, of, out of the front camera here. <laughs> this is tricky to do when the... You're, you're fine. <laughs> pull 
my pliers back a little bit, give it a bit more length. There, you just heard the snap of it going through. Okay, so from there, you should be able to see I've got a piece of like little piece of wire on this side and my long piece on that side. And this is where your secret weapon comes in handy. So you grab your grab two playing cards, fold it in half. and you thread them onto either end of your wire. Okay, so you've made yourself basically a little sandwich. Gonna swap things out for a metal block. So you've got, yeah, wire, playing card, your two pieces of material, second playing card, rest of your wire. Oh, now, one piece of tool that I did not show you, which is also really important, flush cutters. Um, a normal pair of pliers will, when you cut your wire, you end up with, uh, you'll end up with your wire kind of like this it will, um, you'll have two points on both sides of the pieces of wire that you've cut. Uh, with flush cutters, you'll end up with one side being nice and flat and only one side having that point. If you can get a pair of flush cutters um, for riveting, it makes your job a lot easier because you don't have to clean up that point and therefore risk marking or damaging your work. So again, another secret weapon. There's two secret weapons, flush cutters and your playing cards. So I've made my sandwich and I'm going to be pushing down really hard so that that wire is pushed down. I'm gonna take my flush cutters with the flat side down towards everything, push down with, uh, with the flush cutters and then I cut. What that means is that I've got a nice flat surface already there. If you don't have flush cutters, you're going to end up with a point and therefore you do need to file that off. So what I would do is leave my pieces of cardboard in place and file this off with those in place so that you can protect your work. So I have then got a piece of wire that is only fractionally larger than my, uh, my pieces of material. With rivets, um, what they generally talk about is that your rivet should be two thirds of the diameter of the wire higher on each side. And trying to measure that is incredibly difficult. Um, you know, and getting each one exactly the same length and then trying to thread through something that is only that long, um, it just makes for a world of pain. Um, so this method just gives you, yeah, kind of an accurate cut measurement that gives you enough to push over. Now, having said that, this is only going to work for kind of jewelry sized wire um, for I would say this, this kind of measurement might work for anything from between 0.8 up to maybe 1.5. Once you get past that, you might need, you know, three or four layers of cardboard to give you enough metal to be able to still push over. Um, I've done pieces in the past where it might be uh, like five mil wire that I've used and then I'll use something like a one mil sheet of metal on either side as my kind of gauge. And that means, again, I still get that accurate measurement on both sides, but I'm being able to um, yeah, cut it easily 
measure it easily, thread through first, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I do find this method just brilliant. So thank you, Tim or um, Charles, whoever came up with this, your legends. All right, so the next thing you want to do is depending on the material that you've got, um, is potentially protect your work. Uh, so something like anodized aluminium, um, where you don't want to mark the color, uh, something like, um, you know, maybe laminate, so something like that. Um, that might be something you want to protect. Um, so just putting little bits of masking tape around your work. And what I'll do, I'll, I'll protect one side and not the other. And then you can see the difference. So you don't want to have the, the um, masking tape right up against the, um, the rivet, otherwise it will um, kind of get in the way and prevent it from bending over, but just enough around it so that it's kind of masking the masking the material. So now we can begin hammering. So I've got a couple of different hammers here. Um, these are, are both kind of riveting hammers, but they serve different purposes. Um, so this one has a kind of a very pointed um, end and it can be useful for getting into rivets that are in tight spaces or um, underneath things, uh, like, un like under un other elements of the design. Um, but pros and cons for all of them. Uh, if you are not accurate with your hammering, then you can end up with like corner marks from the edges of the hammer where they mark your metal. Um, the other end is nice and flat, so that's really good for a, a square hammer. But again, if you're not accurate with your hammering and you angle it, uh, then again, you can mark your work. Uh, so for a classic mushroom one, the one I like to use is just the classic kind of round head. Um, so what I'm going to do, what's my time like? All right. Uh, I might, we'll see how, how long we take. Um, I might do hammer one side with this one to get the mushroom shape and hammer the other side with this shape to get the square rivet. Um, so with riveting, uh, try as much as possible to get your body in the right position. Um, I like to rest my arm against my bench so I'm not kind of floating up and you know hurting myself. Uh, so get your body in a good comfortable position. And this is gonna be really weird because I can't see over the top. So if I lean down really close, I'm as blind as a bat. Um, <laughs> You'll um, have to excuse me. So when you're riveting from the top, from this mushroom shape, I'm going around and around just to create a little lip. But I don't keep going on this one side forever and ever because I've pushed this through to, give, to lift that wire up. And if I just keep going, then there's absolutely no wire on the other side and it will just fall out. So I need to flip it over constantly to make sure it's even. So I flip over, I push this side down and I'll, for this demonstration, I'm gonna flip my hammer to do this side square. So for this one, I really am, I'm just hammering in the one direction uh, just to spread the metal out. I'm not trying to shape or anything. If I start to angle this hammer, I'm gonna mark my work. This might sound a little bit pedantic, but quite often what I will do is actually count how many hits I do on both sides so that my rivets will be nice and even. Um, and especially when you're doing 
the same type of rivet on both sides. You want them both to look approximately the same size. So making sure that you hammer approximately evenly will help make sure that those rivets are the same. So back to the mushroom rivet, using my round here. And sometimes, yeah, I'll count, you know, maybe 30 hits. And then I'll flip over. Back to my square head, push it down. Flip over, go back to my mushroom. With the mushroom, I'm trying to uh, do another little picture for you. Just very quickly so that you can see. So this is the beginning of my mushroom happening. I'm kind of angling in and going around at the same time. So my hammer is coming in from different directions as I'm going around the rivet. So there's my kind of rivet head. I'm coming in from different angles as I rotate around the, around the rivet head. In the angle, but on the square one, I don't want to do that. I just want to keep going down in one position. Back over. You might be able to notice, I don't know whether it comes through on uh, Facebook Live, but you can actually hear when you hit the rivet and when you miss the rivet, there's quite a different sound. Um, so always aim, of course, for the rivet and not your work. Uh, but yeah, you'll hear it if you like, yeah, like that's the aluminium, if I'm hitting that, that's the copper rivet. Likewise, if you hit your finger, we'd hear a different sound as well, I'm sure. Exactly, yes, yes, that, that will be a much more painful cry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my rivet on the back is nice and round and, um, yeah, it's kind of just coming over the edge of the metal. Um, however, I don't know if you can see, um, there are ever so slight marks where the edge of my hammer has just caught that metal. So depending on your piece, um, that might be easy for you to clean up. If it's not going to be easy for you to clean up, then use your, um, nice. your masking tape or something else to, yeah, to protect the work. So if I peel this off, you might want to keep it though, just in case. With a, with a rivet like this, um, with the mushroom rivet, the way that you can tell that it has, is going to be its, its peak performance is if you run your finger over it and it doesn't catch. So run your finger over in every direction and if it just feels like a nice smooth bump in the metal, that's perfect. If you pull your finger across it and it catches on your skin, then you know that that area needs a little bit more hammering to push over um, so that it doesn't catch. With a square rivet though, you'll be able to feel it from every side. Um, so again, design decision there of what the best type of rivet is going to be. Um, for your, for your design. So things like, you might not want that, like on the back of a necklace where it's going to rub on skin, or if it's going to catch 
hair constantly um, getting around it. So yeah, a bit of a design decision then about which one's going to be the most effective or um, comfortable for your design. Um, now, also, you should not be able to move your pieces once it's riveted. If it's nice and firm, um, yeah, it, it shouldn't move. Uh, however, you might actually want a little bit of movement in your piece. So in that case, you might need to like not hammer quite as much and get it to a point where it will have a little bit of movement. So something like um, dangly earrings and you've got multiple pieces that you're riveting together but you want the movement, then possibly giving yourself a fraction more metal in your wire um, so it will still hang over and not allow the pieces to come apart, but there's a little bit more length to allow, allow some movement. Now, another thing for when you're thinking through yeah, riveting pieces is, um, so something like this with four rivets, I have, you drill one hole first and you rivet that one. Don't try and drill all your holes, especially if it's not stuck together or anything. Don't try and drill all your holes first and then rivet them because inevitably your piece will have moved just a fraction and the holes won't line up. So drill one first, rivet that one, get that one in place. Align your second one, drill that one, rivet the second one, then do your third, then, then do your fourth. Um, so on this piece, you know, I've got the very real danger that, you know, because there's only one rivet there, that has the potential to move if I knock it or anything like that. So I've got one rivet in place. Now I would mark out where my second rivet is going to be, opposite side somewhere. Um, and I drill that hole and start the rivet. Um, have we got time to do the second one or would it be helpful to do another very quick demo of that? Or do we think that people have seen enough? Give me your feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can hear the audience asking for more as we speak, Catherine. So Cool. All right. So I'll run through it. Yeah. yeah, run through it quickly. So we've got our first piece in place. Um, so just before you start on that, I've got a couple of little questions from Ariane. Oh, yes. Yes, if there's questions, yeah, let's do some questions. And, um, yeah, so she's asked, uh, would you preform one end of the wire before uh, inserting it? Mm. Yes, you can. Um, so for some designs, uh, like uh, a lady in a class that I was teaching, what she did was um, balled up the end of a piece of silver. So she had a nice round ball and she used that as her rivet head to then, um, yeah, and because that was nice and big, that made a really nice feature because it was the eye of a fish. Um, so yes, you could do that, pre-make that, feed it through, and then, um, then just use your one piece of, just use your one piece and cut that off, flush cut it, and hammer just the one side. Be aware though, that whatever preforming you do on the other side, um, you may have to think through how to position that so it doesn't get affected. So if you did have that round, nice round silver ball and you're hammering straight onto a piece of metal, that round ball is going to get flattened. Uh, so think through, how you might avoid that. So you might end up using like a vice. I don't know if you, don't know if you can see my vice over there, um, but a vice where you can like, you know, pop the ball down in between the, um, the vice. Yeah, in the recess between, yeah. Yes, but thank you, <laughs> the recess and then hammer on top. Um, or, you know, maybe using this, 
the, the smallest um, depression on your dapping block, maybe. Uh, so yeah, just you'll have to think through um, how you would do that preforming. The other way that you can do that is quite often for things like rings, um, where you've got a riveted, you know, something like yeah, plastic or laminate or whatever, riveted onto a ring, it can be incredibly difficult to rivet on the inside of a ring. So you may want to like preform that end um, somehow. So the way that I do that is again, I would put my wire into the vise and I would start doing the classic hammering and spreading it out. And as once I've got a nice um, lip on it, thread that through from the inside of the ring, put my pieces on top, then do the flush cut hammer. But again, you've still got that same problem of um, how you're going to hammer from the outside. So that's when, you know, a little anvil like this, where I can put the ring around this piece and then I'm hammering on top. So it's all about um, thinking through the problems and finding the solutions. I, I do feel like jewelry making is often problem solving. Great question, thank you. Yeah, what else have done? Continual problems to solve. Now, <laughs> right. Marietta did ask another question about a bezel and I've just I've lost it. There's been so many other responses now. Uh, we've, got, we've got one here from uh, Debbie in the meantime. Uh -huh. Marietta, if you can repost your question, that'd be handy. Uh, Debbie's made a comment, put it over a small pre-drilled hole on the wood block can work. Mm. Yeah, that could actually work very nicely. Um, try to have a nice hardwood block underneath. Um, yeah, so that it actually forms and isn't just depressing into the wood. Um, but yeah, that would that'd be quite a nice solution, I think. Good thinking. I love the jewellery crowd. We all have our, um, yeah, everybody's got different solutions um, to the problems we face. And, yeah, if we can share our knowledge, uh, awesome. Thanks for that one. <laughs> Indeed. I'm sure there's always more than one way to skin a cat. Oh, yeah. exactly. You know, there's five or six different ways to solder the same piece. Um, yeah, this is not the only way. To rivet, uh, it's just the way that I do because I found it easy. Mm. Um, if you want to check out excellent riveting, check out Cinnamon Lee's work. Her riveting is perfection. Um, almost all of hers is flush or countersunk rivets, immaculate, perfect little circles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Russell's made a comment. I often make a post soldered into metal, assuming material can be soldered and riveted on one side. <laughs> yeah. No, that sounds like a yeah, a good solution for for a particular situation. Yeah. So certainly, if you if your metal can be soldered then you may be able to um, use those two different methods. Use some soldering to do part of the job and then yeah, use the riveting for the other part. Uh, so definitely all about design solutions. <laughs> now I found um, Arietta's other question. Uh, okay. um, can you use a be bezel setting tip sometime? Clearly a dedicated one perhaps. A bezel setting tip. For, the, for making the rivet, I'm not quite sure what is being asked there. Yeah, if you could uh, just expand on that, Orietta, that'd be great. No worries. So uh, that's it for the moment, other than some nice comments about uh, there are people who are enjoying the presentation. Catherine? Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. I feel like we probably, we're about to hit the limit of our time. So we might run out of time to do a whole nother demonstration, but um, at least that gives you some of the basic skills for riveting. And if you'd like to come and join us another time to learn uh, 
about tube riveting and spaced riveting, um, flush riveting. Uh, they, they take a little bit more time. There's a few more steps involved in that. But this gives you the, the basic um, kind of understanding of how to do uh, the classic rivet. <laughs> And yeah, as it's Catherine alluded to, great. we'll be back for more in the future. So stay, stay tuned to this channel, AJS TV. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you again very soon, Catherine. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, AJS, for the incredible privilege and honour it is to, uh, to be able to spread the joy of rivets. Uh, I love them. I, I use them quite a lot in my work. And I think they're a great way of being able to, yeah, not just the practical side of joining metals, but also a decorative way of um, making a feature of joins. So thanks guys. And yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to teach. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks Catherine. See you next time. See ya. Thanks everybody.